Great, thank you, thank you all for coming. Um, so this is uh, VR and AR in 25 minutes. Um, the, uh, as long as we're talking about me, um, I'll tell you uh, uh, a few things and then we'll, we'll skip ahead to something of substance. Uh, but while at Disney, um, I am famous for coming up with the idea of the Lion King. The idea was to do Bambi in Africa. And uh, my boss, Jeff Katzenberg, at the time said, that's a great idea if you can figure out why Bambi eats the other animals. <laughs> so um, uh, in my uh, role as a VP at Disney, eventually I rolled into the technology side of the company and I was chief operating officer of a project called Virtual World, uh, of which uh, Disney owned the majority. And uh, we opened 23 centers around the world in the 90s. Uh, so. Um, Interestingly, uh, I have a panel that I'm moderating this afternoon on location-based entertainment, and I'm certainly bringing a lot of the questions that were left unanswered by that experience. Um, after that, uh, I did a number of startups, uh, most recently several startups in social media. The first one I did uh, had a very nice exit, the other ones not so much. Uh, and uh, then I started writing about social media, and eventually it led me to writing about VR, and that seemed to stick. Forbes reached out to me, and now, I get to meet everybody and try everything, and I'm not selling anything. So it's a, a, an admirable role to be in. Um, as you can see, I'm not a new guy, so I've seen a few things in my lifetime that are very relevant to what we're talking about today. These represent the disruptions not only, by the way, I see people taking notes. These slides are up on SlideShare, so that might save you from taking pictures or taking notes. Um, it, you know, Each of these disruptions uh, ultimately gave us more control over media and how we consume it. Uh, and it also uh, gave us a greater ability to connect with other people. So uh, connecting with other people uh, is the killer app. It's why you bought a personal computer. It's why you have a smartphone. Yes, they do wonderful, wonderful things. They're handheld computers, but you bought it to connect with other people. The killer app is other people. Um, things happen slowly and then all at once. And uh, as you can see, all at once comes sooner and sooner. Um, let's talk about how people are exposed to VR. I saw a survey this morning that said uh, over 70% of the people in the country have been exposed to VR uh, and are aware of it. And that number has gone up dramatically in the past 18 months. And the question is why? How are people being exposed to VR? And uh, I would say the number one way is through popular culture, um, going back you know, almost 30 years. And um, you know all of these uh, virtual and augmented realities are seeking uh, or depicting uh, us being immersed in other worlds. Uh, significantly, a major motion picture is coming out next year. Most of you know uh, about this project. Uh, it's a seminal book uh, by Ernest Cline. I highly recommend it. It envisions a world in which people spend a considerable amount of, amount of time wearing haptic suits, and, and they've got you know, rigs that allow them um, you know, full motion uh, and locomotion inside of the virtual world, and the interface and the inputs are you know, all haptical and to totally natural. So Steven Spielberg is making this movie. I expect it will define VR in popular culture, for better or worse, because of course, the reality of VR is gonna have nothing to do with what you see in that movie. Um, before we get started, I, you know, this is so new to all of us um, that I thought I would just take five minutes and do some definitions. Um, you know, we have uh, physical reality and digital reality. Uh, and that's the way the world largely is today. Um, but technology is allowing us to merge the digital and the physical, and so we call that mixed reality. Now, mixed reality isn't one thing. Mixed reality is a spectrum. On one side, again, physical reality. On the other side, digital reality. But where we are today is at the extremes of the spectrum, right? We have uh, AR, uh, which really is just enhanced, an enhanced cell phone, or not even an enhanced cell phone. Uh, and, it, and it does very simple, you know, Snapchat filters, does a very simple integration of the digital and the physical. And then we have, um, fully occluded or fully immersive headsets like the Vive and the Rift, um, 
you know, but the majority of our use of virtual and augmented reality is going to be in the middle. Uh, and headsets are going to become um, dual purpose. So they will both bring in uh, the real world through outward facing cameras, and they will also be able to provide a fully immersive uh, digital experience. Um, so uh, really, we are going to spend the future in the middle of the spectrum. And um, I'll get to each of these things later, um, but you know, the point here is first we'll move toward um, augmented reality on enhanced cell phones, and uh, then we'll move to augmented reality uh, on the desktop probably sooner than, than anyone thinks. Um, just another way of thinking about augmented and uh, virtual reality and the amount of presence and immersion each offers us. Uh, you see, when we use AR, particularly on our phones, we are very present in our physical world. When we are wearing a fully occluded headset um, or, or experiencing something like free roam VR, we are completely immersed and unaware of the physical world. A few subtle differences between AR and VR. Um, AR is less computationally expensive because you don't have to make a whole world. You just have to make an object. On the other hand, AR requires a lot more fidelity because you move an object in the real world, it has to move like it's in the real world, and, and that happens to be extremely hard. Um, let's just talk a little bit about how, how we got here. Um, you know, people want to be immersed, and we've tried all sorts of ways to do it. Of course, you get move, immersed in movies and theater uh, through a, uh, something called the suspension of disbelief, where you willfully block out things in order to focus. You're watching television. You're not aware of the room. You're only aware of the television. Your mind played a trick on you. Um, but man has always sought to be immersed. So it wasn't surprising that when the technology arrived, somebody made a television set you could put on your head. And um, the interesting thing about this slide, and I've been thinking about Sutherland a lot lately, because what did he expect when he made this? What did he expect he was going to see? Where did he expect it was going to take us? And, um, you know, the answer is telepresence, right? That's why NASA was interested, right? So you don't have to send a man to Mars. You can be virtually on Mars. And uh, these technologies gave rise to a commercial uh, industry, or the beginning of a commercial industry in the 90s, uh, which was largely driven by this thing. Uh, it's W Industries Virtuality. Uh, and it is, um, was quite terrible, and the software was terrible. It made you sick. The unit cost $60,000, and uh, you could only charge a dollar a minute. And it was an attended device, so it always had to be, uh, you know, so it was labor intensive to run it. Um, so as a result, um, those companies, won't include, including the project I was working on, Virtual World, went out of business. Um, and uh, Nintendo around that time introduced the Virtual Boy, which had to be one of the great product failures of the new millennial. And uh, you know, there were other companies that provided hardware and software. Uh, Silicon Graphics used to provide our graphics cards. They weren't things you could go buy at Best Buy and insert into your computer. Uh, they lived in, in big boxes, and they were expensive. And there were no affordable HMDs. I mean, the HMD you, know, you saw, uh, that was an HMD in uh, 1994. Uh, so, uh, you know, then, oh, and we were bandwidth constrained. There was no way to get, you know, the software to your computer, even if you had a graphics card to run it. Most people were still on dial-up. Um, so uh, there was, a, you know, other things happened that were quite dramatic. <laughs> uh, the internet was one thing, and uh, obviously there was a tremendous flight of capital and interest uh, to that opportunity at the beginning of the century. And then something remarkable happened in 2012. Somebody hacked a couple of cell phones together and made a head-mounted display and put it on Kickstarter and raised um, two, two million dollars in a couple of days. And then a year later, um, that company was acquired by Facebook for several billion dollars. And uh, that was an inflection point that caused everybody in computing to say, hey, wait a minute. Something is happening, and it wasn't just everybody. It wasn't just entrepreneurs and technology people and opportunists. Uh, it was the biggest companies uh, in the world, the biggest software companies in the world. 
Uh, and so quickly we saw, and you know, this is four years after Palmer Lucky's Kickstarter, we saw a rise of consumer HMDs and an ecosystem to support them. Um, so this is virtual reality today. Now I'm gonna play a little trick. Virtual reality 1985, virtual reality today. <laughs> Enough said. Uh, let's move on to augmented reality. Uh, I have here a picture of real augmented reality and then a picture of fantasy augmented reality. Uh, fantasy augmented reality is I'm putting on a pair of, of glasses, enhanced glasses, and you know, now I see holograms. Um, and um, you know, that's a little bit true. I'll get to the issues with uh, HMDs, particularly AR HMDs, uh, in a minute. Uh, but let me just take a shortcut and say, no, you can't buy one. Uh, the photo in the upper left shows augmented reality today. If you have a depth sensing camera uh, that uses SLAM, which is short for um, uh, spatialized location and mapping, uh, which takes um, basically your GPS, which is accurate to 100 yards on Google Maps, uh, and makes it accurate to three feet, so that you can hold up your phone and walk through Lowe's and see all the products on the shelves. You will walk out of uh, you know, this building and hold up your phone and you'll see where the nearest coffee shop is. Um, so that is gonna be a substantial improvement in handheld computing. Um, let's talk about handheld computing just for a minute because it's driving a lot of the thinking behind augmented reality. Um, there are very smart people at major institutions, the MIT Media Lab um, most uh, particularly, who are trying to solve this problem. We look at our cell phones hundreds of times a day. And when we look at them, we're looking into our lap. Uh, when you use Google Maps, uh, you know, it's not projected onto your windshield or projected onto your glasses. It's, you know, on the seat next to you or somewhere on your dashboard and you are shifting your attention back and forth. And obviously it would be much better if, if in your glasses or on your windshield uh, your directions were appearing. It would be safer too. And uh, it would have substantial social effects because we could look at each other while we talked instead of constantly checking for messages. Um, but that world uh, is far away yet because the head-mounted displays for AR are um, not available for consumers. Now, there is a toy called the Zapbox Cardboard, and it uses something called marker-based AR. And the markers act kind of like a QR code. And, you know, they tell um, the phone, the phone you have today, not an advanced depth-sensing phone, um, but they tell your phone today where objects are in the room so that AR uh, can be spatial, displayed in a spatially appropriate way. Things are supposed to be on the floor or on the floor. Things that are supposed to be on the wall are on the wall. Uh, and that's worth playing with, but I, I would say with all these things, you know, you, you see their manifestations in pornography and toys first. And, uh, and then you see them coming to the mainstream consumer market. Um, these are all fantastic devices. I've tried them all. They're terribly interesting and terribly flawed. There are a lot of great enterprise applications for them uh, and almost no applications for consumers. Um, so uh, even if you could buy one, why would you buy one? Now, interestingly, the ODG uh, R8 is going on sale in China via Megu in the fourth quarter. Uh, so that will be the first test of a consumer head-mounted um, Android computer. And uh, that'll be interesting to see how it goes. We'll talk about the challenges that that product and, and products like it have uh, in a minute. So, so let's talk about the present. <laughs> this is AR today. Snapchat filters are AR today. Um, you know, uh, it, it does, you can do games. If you have a depth sensing camera, you can do more, but there aren't that many apps for depth sensing cameras right now. Um, so let's shift to back to VR now. Um, VR is gonna be driven by mobile. It already is driven by mobile. So I tried to, in the illustrations to show the proportion that each of these platforms has of the market. And as you can see, the things we're looking at here at the conference are all on um, you know, uh, uh, Rift and Vive. Uh, but the truth is most people at home looking at VR content, look at it on YouTube, and they use Google Cardboard. Um, so um, the cache and the 
uh, future of VR uh, is on mobile. Uh, this is another great example of an AR application uh, for a, a depth sensing phone. Uh, some really, really interesting things have happened to the AR VR category in the past few months. Um, Microsoft, uh, Apple, and Google have made major announcements, and of course everybody knows about uh, Facebook's legendary uh, problems bringing the Oculus Rift uh, to market. Um, but I thought that, that it would be good to kind of break down the different strategies that the top players are employing, because this is, this is gonna define VR and AR. Um, everything, everything else is, is like, you know, we're like giant fish swimming around a whale trying to get our scraps. Um, but, but this is VR. Now, Microsoft has the HoloLens, and they seem to be pivoting away from it. I think Microsoft has decided that maybe an OEM will make a business out of selling, um, you know, a HoloLens or HoloLens-like device, but that's not going to be their business. They're not going to make hardware. They want to own the operating system, that's what Microsoft does. So they have an MR strategy uh, which is consistent with that, and it basically is plug in any headset, um, use any Bluetooth controllers, such as the Vives, uh, and they will detect the headset through a drop-down, much like you connect a printer today. Uh, and if you, of course, did not have uh, the right software on your PC, um, you then um, could download the drivers. It's really, they're saying, as simple as a, um, and <clears throat> as simple as installing a computer, and, uh, you know, indeed, it would bring the costs down tremendously, um, because uh, all of a sudden, uh, you know, they've found a way to use existing Intel chips, they say, uh, that will uh, be fast enough and have enough fidelity uh, to do MR. Uh, Apple just uh, a few weeks ago introduced the AR kit and announced that iPhone 8 will have depth sensing cameras. Um, AR kit is interesting because they're seeking to make uh, existing Macs work for VR. So the idea is you would buy a box that has a graphics chip in it, and when you plugged your HMD into that, you know, the box plugs into your Mac, it's sort of like a, I guess I'll say a portable hard drive, like a passport, and, and that's the way your Mac can become AR compatible. The new Macs will work like Windows MR. You just plug directly into them and they will have a graphics card built in that is powerful enough uh, to power, uh, you know, true VR experiences. Um, the, uh, uh, the interesting thing about Facebook, of course, is despite their problems with the Rift, uh, they own the Oculus, I mean, they own the, um, yeah, the Oculus Store, which is compatible for Gear VR. And as you recall from my other slides, Gear VR is the second largest platform. They've sold six and a half million Gear VRs. I don't know how many of them are actually being used. I would say probably 10%. Um, and uh, and uh, so, you know, those are, uh, oh, and so Google, fine, last but not least, Google has multiple strategies. Uh, one, of course, has been the cardboard, and uh, you know, to use that with YouTube to deliver rudimentary VR experiences like the New York Times' uh, you know, VR website and, uh, and news and sports and, and generally 360 media, although not exclusively. Um, they have the Daydream, uh, of which they've sold virtually none, um, because it relies on a, on a phone that isn't really on the market. Uh, so that was, that's a good idea, uh, and as phones are replaced, you know, there's a cell phone replacement cycle, so over the next three years, we will all have depth-sensing AR-enhanced cell phones. And so, um, you know, Daydream seems to have been passed by, but not so fast. Um, Daydream is, uh, is coming out with a Daydream power through um, uh, HTC, uh, a standalone headset, uh, that has outward facing cameras and will allow you to access the Daydream store and to do uh, head mounted computing uh, completely untethered. Uh, and it's a $500 product coming out, they say, Q4 in time for Christmas, uh, and that could be a game changer. Uh, I'm, gonna, I'm running out of time, unfortunately, so I will go fast through these slides. And again, they're up on SlideShare. But you can see how fast uh, the industry is poised to go. We're really not quite. Um, far yet in 2017, but then you look at 2019 and you go out to 2020, uh, and this is a you know, $100 billion business. 
Um, Tim Merrill from Digi Capital is going to talk later, and I'm sure we'll go more deeply into these numbers. Um, but why do people upgrade, right? Why would they? Why would you get a head-mounted display? Why? Why would you go to that trouble? And the reason you'll get it is because of what it does, not because what it of what it is. That's what happened with the personal computer. That's what happened with the smartphone, and that is what is going to happen with VR and AR. Um, so when we talk about AR, what are AR's killer apps? And I, I would say to you, going back to my original statement on the first or second slide, um, people will get these devices and use these devices because they do great things that they can't live for without. My contention is that will be uh, communications and connections to other people and ultimately telepresence. And telepresence is not fiction. Telepresence is going to be happening with, with um, increasing frequency uh, in business and, and then for us uh, personally. But uh, first, business is going to, uh, and the military are going to do these things because right now they're very expensive and require specialized applications and uh, they can afford it and you and I can't. Um, but make no mistake, these issues will be solved and sometime in the next decade uh, there will be standalone uh, AR capable glasses and many people will be using them. I think primarily at work, but consumers may want them too if certain problems get solved. Um, one of the two biggest problems I'll talk about here, um, because the other problems are, are, are obvious, um, you know, the one is um, ergonomics. Right? Can you really wear a headset for that long? Would you do that? It's stupid looking. Um, optics, field of view. The optics of uh, the HTC Vive and the Oculus Rift are terrible. And they are terrible. Uh, mobile VR is equally bad because you have the screen door, meaning you see the pixels really close to your eyes. So you see everything for, through a screen door. So it's great. You took a 360 camera up to the top of Mount Everest, and I can't see anything. So, you know, there are, there are substantial problems. The other thing particular to AR is that when you look at an AR headset, only a small amount of your field of view has, and this is true of the HoloLens and all the other ones, only a small amount, 35 to 55 degrees of your field of view, contains the virtual object. So you kind of have to position your head to see the holograms. Uh, and uh, Reggie Watts says it's like looking through a night's visor. And um, until those problems, you know, consumers don't care about field of view. Nobody's going to buy a headset that has a night slit um, unless they need it for enterprise. So, you know, when are these things going to be under the Christmas tree? They're going to be under the Christmas tree when those problems get solved. And as a result, we find ourselves in a trough of disillusionment. And I have to say, the press, of which I am now a member, is partly responsible for this, right? Because the past two years, we've been saying, VR is coming, VR is coming, VR is amazing. And guess what? It's not for sale. And the stuff that is for sale ain't that great. So there's a trough of disillusionment. But there's also a big ecosystem of extremely big companies and very smart people you know, tens of thousands of brilliant engineers spend all day long solving these problems. So I happen to believe they're going to be solved. Um, this is a content-hungry platform. Uh, and right now, there ain't a lot of content. Uh, so, you know, 360 video represents most of the VR content that's out there, uh, particularly for mobile platforms. Uh, you know, and it will be for a while until more digital uh, content catches up to it. Um, I do think 360 is going to happen big time for consumers, again, because it takes something they're already doing, taking pictures when they travel, taking underwater photos, and it's going to make it much, much better. Um, the views, which is uh, uh, demoing out here, uh, and then there's another one, a uh, French company called Gyroptic uh, that puts a little bug on the top of your iPhone and allows you to take actually not pretty good 360 video, and it's a $300 product. So. That you might find under the Christmas tree this year. Um, so what are we going to do, right? We have these outward-facing cameras. We have all these boxes. Uh, what are we going to do? And again, I think the, the war will be fought on the turf of social VR because that is what brings people together. Uh, I talked about the ecosystem, um, and that ecosystem is a big reason why uh, 2017 is going to be different uh, than 1996. 
Uh, I wanted to talk a little about HTC, but I'm running out of time, so uh, let me just say this about HTC. Everything that they're doing shows two things. One, it shows their awareness of the weakness of the AT HTC Vive and all the things that need to happen to expose people to VR, to bring down the price, to provide an ecosystem of content and peripherals uh, that would make you have to have it. Um, I talked about the Daydream standalone. I think this is going to be the first VR product that really proliferates the consumer market because of the price, because it's untethered. Um, I think there will be a lot of curiosity around it. A lot of people are making them. Um, HTC is one, again, part of their very enlightened strategy. And uh, Lenovo and others. So, so there's going to be price pressure on it. There's going to be competition. And it's going to be outward facing, meaning it will do both AR and VR. Um, VRcades give us a look at uh, what might be in the future. A lot of VRcades are just showing us what you could see at home. Um, HTC, again, is providing an arcade package. And a lot of these are being thrown up by moms and pops. Um, but there are also some big companies like IMAX uh, trying to crack this nut. Having worked in this field in the 90s, I will surface only one issue and let you think about it. Um, this product has a tremendous utilization and throughput problem. Utilization is how often are the machines used, what percentage of the time, and the other one is utilization, which means, in short, you don't have enough seats on Saturday night, and you've got too much seats the rest of the time. You have to make 80% of your money between Friday at 7 p.m. and Sunday at 7 p.m. But you only have a limited number of turns. You only have four turns per station per hour, and you have a ton of labor, real estate, and marketing costs. So it's a very challenging business. Uh, it's almost better being done moms and pops uh, because you lower the overhead and labor costs. Uh, but, you know, right now there's a site called VRN-ish, which is listing all the VRcades. It's a voluntary list, so these are just operators listing their sites there. There are 323, six of them here in Toronto already. Uh, and we'll be talking later on today about 2-Bit Circus that is building a, uh, a, a VR theme park. Uh, nomadic VR, uh, the Void VR, uh, Zero Latency, Dreamscape, and a number of others are providing warehouse scale VR, which is quite amazing. Um, New York just opened a House of VR, which is a VR nightclub. Uh, so this is happening, and I think this will uh, go a long way to exposing the public uh, to VR. So uh, let me give you my predictions for next year. Uh, neither VR nor AR will arrive yet. Uh, their numbers will continue to be small. Um, but the prices will come down. The phone replacement cycle will probably be in full swing by this time next year. Uh, the iPhone 8 will be out. iPhones get upgraded at a remarkably fast rate. Uh, and Magic Leap, which I haven't talked about and I don't have time to talk about, uh, is also going to introduce a product in 2018, my prediction. Uh, 2023, and the thing about 2023 that I want everybody to think about as I close are the social implications of technology and what we are doing and the unintended consequences that, that the entire world is going to face. Um, because the technology that creates AR and is going to create fantastic experiences for all of us uh, is also going to be applied to industry. In fact, it already is being applied to industry. And when there are self-driving cars and trucks, and when there are uh, no taxi drivers and no Uber drivers and no truck drivers, and uh, AI and automation um, put people out of work, there will not be replacement jobs for those people. And what's more, the money that those people did make is going to be taken out of the economy and go to the technical classes on the coast and investors. And that is going to lead to an historic wealth gap. And I don't believe there's any way that that can be stopped. And it has serious, serious social implications that um, you know, bear some thinking about. Um, although I think it's full speed ahead for all of us uh, developing this new field. So I want to thank you for listening to me. Uh, I love telling your stories. The development of VR and AR is a great story. There are still a lot of unknowns, some known unknowns, and some unknown unknowns that add lots of twists and turns to the story as we have seen this spring uh, with those surprising announcements from um, Google and Microsoft. Uh, there is clearly going to be a battle between uh, the big four computer companies for this market. Uh, I don't think all four of them will win. It's possible, but I, I, not what happened with cell phones or, or with personal computing. 
Um, so uh, it'll be interesting to be back here uh, in 2023, and I'll bring that slide with me, and we'll sing how, see how well I guessed.